What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here, and you know, everyone's been so just up in arms about graphics cards and stuff, I think people forgot there actually are CPUs out there to be talked about, and AMD is just, for the last couple of years, it's been sort of unchallenged in, this, in the CPU space, and we've talked about like epic fall of Intel. Well, <laughs> Intel's fighting back, guys. We're gonna talk about the uh, Alder Lake uh, platform that's coming out here in about a month. And uh, this is not new news, it's just I'm finally going to kind of give you guys a roundup of what to expect with Alder Lake and whether or not it's one you should consider worth uh, buying or upgrading to. So we'll talk about a couple of different perspectives here with the specs, there's a lot to talk about, so let's just get to it. This video is sponsored by Micro Center and their custom PC builder. Use a custom PC builder to plan your next build and when parts are added to your cart and in-store pickup is selected, you have the option for Micro Center technician to fully build your PC for an extra fee. And if the order is placed at least four hours before closing, you can enjoy your new PC the very same day. Get the best prices and parts selection at any of Micro Center's 25 locations across the United States. And right now, new customers can get a free 240 gigabyte SSD while supplies last in-store only and limit one per email. To see everything that Micro Center has to offer and to learn more about this limited time SSD giveaway, click the link in the description below. Obviously, Alder Lake is gonna be running on DDR5. Uh, DDR5 launch is going to be kind of like coinciding with Intel's launch of Alder Lake. Um, we're not talking about DDR5 specs, but I can tell you right now, it's expected to be quite a bit faster than DDR4. Um, maybe we'll do it. If you guys are interested in a DDR5 roundup in terms of what to expect, then we'll talk about that in another video. You guys can sign up down in the comments below. One of the first things we saw with Alder Lake that really made us scratch our heads was like 16 cores, 24 threads. How, how does that work? Is it is it triper threading? <laughs> Not hyper, is it triper threading? Is there three threads per CPU? So this is something that Intel has tried to do in the past with Cove Lake, but it didn't work out very, very well. The performance was actually terrible. And that is we are gonna see Intel finally make a powerful CPU that is a hybrid. So what that means is we're gonna have P cores and we're gonna have E cores. Cores that are dedicated to performance tasks that are also hyper-threaded and efficiency cores that are designed for single-threaded, non-high-performance tasks which are extremely efficient in terms of how much power they draw and you know how many of them that there are. So this, this is not new technology. This is something we've seen other brands come out with. I mean, Apple is very, uh, has very much done stuff like this with their M chip. Without going into too much detail of how this has been done in the past, this is finally being done by Intel, theoretically, in a way, that is going to actually be useful to most gamers. So let's talk about how they achieve that 16 core, 24 thread. Essentially, this is an eight core and eight core processor. But Jay, it's only 16. That's true, there are eight P core threads, which also have hyper threading, giving you 16 logical threads right there. And then we've got eight E cores, which are very tiny, and they, they almost look like a, a like a, I mean, four of them put together don't even equal one P core. However, those are not hyper-threaded, they're individual little cores, and those are designed to handle your low power tasks, a lot of your idle operations, things that are just not necessary to have your P core or your performance core running full speed or crazy. So you have eight non-hyper-threading E cores, which are tiny, and then eight hyper-threaded P cores, which give you 16, so 16 plus eight, that's how you get your 24. See, initially when we saw this, we thought it was some sort of a typo until we sort of delved into that. Now, if we take a look at the substrate design, it's interesting because Intel initially kind of teased AMD when, when Ryzen first came out and was like, well, we don't use glue in our processors. But really, what we have here is a very similar type. I feel like what happened here is Intel went AMD's CCX design. It's Ryzen chiplet design where you have the memory controller in independent from the chiplets. And the chiplets are known as CCXs and those uh, intercommunicate through the Infinity Fabric and it's kind of been the way the design has gone with Ryzen and it's gotten efficient, it's gotten faster. The interconnect with the Infinity Fabric has gotten much, much faster latency, which means it, no longer do you really get stutters and, and issues with trading off between the different CCXs. And that's over the last, what, five years of uh, maturity of Intel, Intel's or AMD's Ryzen design. But I feel like Intel went from making fun of it to going, huh, we tried something like this. How, how can we do this and make it better? So Intel obviously has the, they're not chiplets, but they have the E cores and the P cores on the same substrate. There is an interconnect. If you look at the design uh, right here next to it, you can see there's an interconnect next to those chiplets and, or not chiplets, but E cores and P cores, which would make a very seamless trade-off. 
Because one of the design challenges there is gonna be how do you hand off between E-Core and P-Core and have it be seamless, have it be low latency, and not have it interfere with things like if you're gaming and then other background tasks happen in the background. Now this was actually designed in uh, collaboration with uh, Microsoft. So Intel and Microsoft worked together to come up with a scheduler in Windows that can actually make sense of the E cores and P cores and intelligently hand off certain tasks to E cores or P cores depending on, well, I mean, the developer can say, hey, we recommend P core. Like run, run this task, this scheduler on the P core and let, and let the performance do its thing. However, Windows could override that and say, nope, P cores are, out, are utilized. It's going to run over here on the E cores or back and forth. But let's paint a little hypothetical here. Let's say you're playing a game, right? You've got auto updates on, you got, and by auto updates, I mean like Steam, EA, you know, all that sort of stuff. You've got your, your um, Adobe Cloud running in the background and all that stuff's got auto updates on. And you're playing a game, you've ever suddenly had the game start stuttering or huge pauses in your game, like second long pause, you're just like, what is that stutter? It was probably a background task that fired up. And for that moment, the scheduler had to handle it and go, oh, okay, uh, uh, we'll put you over here, game cores, we'll move you over here. And everything had to kind of bounce around the exact same die. And then the scheduler had to make sense of what was what. But the new intelligent scheduler designed between you know, Microsoft and Intel here is going to know Okay, this is an E-Core task, this is a P-Core task. P-Cores are busy, let's not bother them. They're playing games. Let's go ahead and run this on the E-Core down here. Let's downclock it, let's let it do its thing. It's like two independent CPUs inside one chip that operate independently of each other. So your game while you're playing will never even, even know that something fired up in the background. The downside is this only works on Windows 11. And if you're Microsoft and you want people to adopt your operating system that's new, because people are obviously are slow to adopt new OSs, rightfully so, you're gonna try and force people to go down a certain path when it comes to um, when, it, when it comes to that sort of technology. Just just like the way Windows 10 was required to take advantage of any, I think it was the 9900K features and up, you had to have Windows 10. So unfortunately, the same thing is true for Windows 11. The interesting thing about this is the P cores are derivative of their their evolutionary. 14 nanometer plus, 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 plus to the third power, which at this point, it looks like they might actually be a new architecture entirely and maybe a new process. I'm not entirely sure. They are calling it their Intel 7, but the E cores are actually based on Intel Atom, which has been extremely efficient, very well established in terms of uh, tablet computing and such. Um, so you, now you get the efficiency of Intel Atom with the performance of something like Rocket Lake but evolved. In fact, Intel themselves are saying something around the 19% performance lift on single thread. That is pretty massive, considering we had only been seeing anywhere between like three to 5% generation on generation uplift from like 8,700K and up. So like 5%, 5%. We're gonna see theoretically as much uplift in one generational family jump here as we've seen over the last four generations of Intel's family jumps. So. That old TikTok, TikTok thing that they kind of did away from, looks like that might be the case. But instead of now just trying to make the cores faster, the process smaller, and then the, you know, the IPC, the obviously improvement there in terms of faster and efficiency have been handled now by laterally designing a substrate and a chip that handles tasks independently from each other to make things more efficient. So efficient and powerful. Now desktops are gonna have eight cores, uh, eight performance cores, eight efficiency cores. Mobile, it's gonna have six performance cores, eight efficiency cores, and then ultra mobile, which are like your super thin tablet type design, is gonna have two performance cores and eight efficiency cores. So it looks like the eight efficiency atom cores that we're seeing on desktop are gonna make their way all the way down to the ultra mobile, which means that if you're not doing gaming and stuff, but you're doing light tasks like um, general browsing, uh, maybe Microsoft Office, such like that, are gonna be just as fast on your desktop as they are on your thin and light, or your extreme thin and light, which, which is kind of nice for the traveling professional that often if you switch to something like a, a Microsoft Surface or, or a super thin laptop, you're not necessarily giving up a whole bunch of performance. Now the cool thing about Alder Lake is the fact that it's gonna be backwards compatible with DDR4. One of the problems when it comes to upgrading to a new platform is if you're sitting here on a 10900, like my system at home is a 10900K. I skipped 11th gen because I wanted the 10 cores and 20 threads. And 11th gen 11900K strips two cores and two threads away in exchange for IPC. The IPC uplift wasn't enough for what I do at home to warrant the upgrade, upgrade to an 11900K. 
because of the fact that I wanted the extra four threads and I was willing to give up the five or so percent IPC improvement for that. So it didn't warrant getting a new motherboard, although I could have still run the, the 10th gen motherboard. You saw how that went with my daughter's build. So I always avoid doing those types of upgrades if I can avoid it. I like to stick to the launch platform on the platform it was designed for. But now, if we take a look at the, uh, the upgrade path here, I would need a new motherboard, new CPU, new RAM if I wanna take advantage of all of the features when it comes to the performance of the CPU uh, and the performance uplift that we're seeing with DDR5, at least with the current leaks, and a new cooler. Because here's the thing, LGA1700 is the new socket type for Intel, Alder Lake. However, it's looking like the actual square design that you guys are used to seeing with the little slidey tabs that will just always line up with the square holes on the backside of the motherboard is no longer going to be compatible because of the fact that it's a more rectangular design now. Because it appears like this is going to be a larger substrate, a larger CPU entirely, a larger socket means a larger mounting mechanism. So I could predict that a couple of things are potentially gonna happen here. Intel is gonna probably provide your cooler masters and your EK water blocks and your Noctua's and, and, and your bit bits power and your be quiet and all that sort of stuff and all these cooler manufacturers with a socket dimension like maybe model or a CAD that will allow people to then create new coolers and potentially a new retention bracket that can be provided to those that have existing coolers that way they can have legacy support for older coolers with just having to change your mounting mechanism. Hopefully that stuff will be available on day one launch for these platforms otherwise you're gonna be stuck with uh, a, a brand new platform that you can't necessarily cool, which I, I don't see being the case. Intel kind of moved away from their box coolers a long time ago for their performance stuff, which means they're gonna need third-party support when it comes to cooling. So I, rec I, I highly anticipate seeing brackets for existing users and new coolers entirely designed for the new platform. I don't believe the, the package substrate or the IHS design is gonna grow in such a, a way that the cooler size themselves, whether it comes to the Asetek water blocks or EK water blocks or whatever it is, uh, your Corsair water blocks, are they're gonna be fine in terms of their size of their cold plate. I think it's just the mounting mechanism has changed enough to make it not be compatible anymore. So that's a downside of upgrading with this is potentially new cooler. There's a lot of things here that are also coming along with uh, Alder Lake. PCIe Gen 5, which is an interesting one. And I, and I believe that this is one that's going to obviously be, um, has been designed for their Xeon and server clientele because they did say Alder Lake um, is going to be available and support Z new Xeon as well. And then we've got Alder Lake S or whatever coming out in the future, which will probably be, be a new X99 pla or X platform, X299, X399. I don't think they'll call it X399. Intel or AMD does. So they'll probably call it X599, something like that. But um, Gen 5, PCIe Gen 5, is only going to be saturated through having like massive amounts of SSDs sitting there on some sort of PCIe controller to, that's going to make sense for like server solutions, enterprise solutions, that massive amounts of fast storage is necessary. We still have not full, even begun to saturate PCIe Gen 4 on uh, PCI when it comes to graphics cards. So that's not a graphics card move. As much as people want to be like, oh, this is proof of a new graphics card. No, it's not. It's not. It's just, it's about support for your third party controllers and such for massive raids and, and stuff like that when it comes to, to storage. So it is, it is a potential benefit when it comes to adopting Intel. Now, if you're sitting here on like a Ryzen 5000 series or even a Ryzen 3000 series, or you're sitting here on an Intel 10, 10th gen or even a 9th gen, it probably wouldn't be that worth of an upgrade to you because of the fact that you need to buy a whole new platform, like I said. If you're, if you're timing building a new computer around this Christmas or fall, and it's a, it's a computer you gotta buy all new parts for anyway, and you have the budget, because you can expect early adopters of a new platform always pay the highest prices. The C, the, ele, the I almost said the 11, the 12900K, if that's what it's called, right now is reported, purported to be $999. That's $250 more than a 5950X. So already, unless we're seeing $250 more performance or at this point, I guess that would be about, set, uh, what, 33% faster than a 5950X. You're gonna pay 33% more than it, and if you don't get 33% more performance, then that's one of those value adds of like, is it worth it? Well, it might be, because 
you know, if you're building a whole new system and you want DDR5 and you want the PCIe Gen 5 and those things, that forward compatibility matters to you, then that's the platform you got to go with. If you're sitting here on an older Intel and you just want to upgrade the CPU, you're going to have to buy a whole new platform. So buying and building a new system from scratch, it makes sense. If you've got the coin, because it's going to be more expensive, then it's, it's worth it at that point. Gaming performance, anything that sees IPC uplift is going to obviously give you a better gaming performance if your graphics card is currently being CPU bound in any sort of way. If you're already 100% GPU bound in the games that you play on the system that you're on, you will not see a, a, a tangible improvement in performance by upgrading your CPU if you're already GPU bound. If you're running something like a 3070 or a 3060 or a 2080 or 2060 Ti or whatever, going to Alder Lake is not going to give you a better gaming performance if the games that you play are not big sandboxes that heavily rely on CPU. So that we can just get that one out of the way right there. But if you look at the, if you look at the leak performance in terms of IPC though, which I mentioned earlier, we're seeing over two, again, grain of salt. These leaks are, 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 sometimes I feel like these are controlled leaks by the brands themselves. Like if I were Intel and I was getting my ass handed to me by AMD for the last several years, I would probably want to give a little, you know, a little, a little crust of info here and there just to get people talking about it. Like we're doing right now. Maybe we're being manipulated and we're just a pawn now in the big Intel media marketing you know, wheel that's turning. But if these crumbs of information turn out to be true, then it's something to be excited for because competition being back is amazing. Because current Intel platform and AMD just have full-size cores with either SMT or hyper-threading going full speed when they're touched depending on what they're doing and just bouncing all around the place. But now if you've got something that's a hybrid design like this, that's just as fast, if not faster in multi-performance or multi-threaded performance, 19% reported uplift in IPC and it's efficient to boot and it's DDR5 and it's PCIe Gen 5. That means maybe Intel was actually quietly working on something in the background. I think the only drawback to it is gonna be the price, obviously, anything. Anything price-wise right now is going to be expensive. And you can expect there to be inflated pricing at the retailers because if this is if this is highly, if this isn't something anybody wants during a chip shortage right now, it's going to have a, an increased price. And then the potential cooler issues, depending on whether or not your cooler that you're using ends up getting a brand, a bracket designed for it at the time of launch, or if you got to buy a new cooler, that's an added cost right there. CPU wars are here. And this is a, I'm looking forward to this one because, um, I mean, let's just face it, building computers is fun and seeing them get faster every single time, it's addicting. That's why we're all here. We're, we're all huge fans of PC and PC gaming and PC accessories, you know? Why not get excited over this stuff? Sound off down below. Have you been waiting for Alder Lake? Are you interested in it? Or would you potentially hold out for a Dash S variant giving us potentially a new extreme platform? Because imagine if you had a new X599 platform and you've got 16 P cores with 32 P threads and 16 efficiency cores. That might give Threadripper a run for its money. All right, guys, sign off in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.